All right, so let me uh, go on. So um, you've seen this many times in a whole bunch of contexts, conferences, courses, and that. So I, I like to, at least at the start of our course, I won't do this every week, but yeah, a land acknowledgement. And this is particularly important to, to uh, me because a lot of the work I've been doing, a, a new course I taught in the fall called Two Eyed Seen, which is bringing together indigenous knowledge with, with so-called Western science. Um, it's really elevated for me and talking to people like Aaron Smith um, who, are, who are kind of integrating to those two ways of knowing. Um, yeah, that, and talking to uh, especially uh, a guy who really helped me out with the two I'd seen course was Dave Mott, uh, former chief of the Alderville First Nation. And we were chatting about land acknowledgements. And, you know, I, I got this up here because I want you to recognize, you've, you've heard these words before. This is the Ontario Tech Agreed Land Acknowledgement, which Dave actually thought, he, he thought that was pretty good relative to some he's heard. The challenge he and I talked about with land acknowledgements is, is often feels like, oh, you know, I've acknowledged, you know, it, it's kind of like, have you ever been on a, like a Via Rail um, trip or Air Canada and that, thank you for your patience, you know, when the, the plane is six hours late. And this, this is, you know, we give thanks for welcoming us on these lands. And, you know, um, so that welcome is kind of presumed. And, and Dave and I had a really good chat about that. So I think it is really important. And and some of the words here express that where, and, and Flavia and I, like a lot of our research, I don't know how much your research is sort of place-based, but, you know, we work in ecosystems that are here. So beyond our campus, and we work on, issues that are incredibly important to indigenous communities here so so uh, i just wanted to flag that and and maybe just twig that with you it's certainly true of your stuff as well vivin um and just thinking about that as you as you go about your research okay so today we're i'm sort of setting the table for what you're going to do um, so I want to do that before I get, you know, we're going to do the boring syllabus stuff. So I'll tell you exactly what we're going to do and how I'm going to evaluate and all that. But I, I want to sort of start the process by just giving you this new approach I have, which to to stats, to to working with data, because I think in a lot of cases, um, you know, Vivian, like your honors thesis colleagues, um, sometimes they'll they'll get a cool problem. There's probably a bunch of friends that you have that they collected a whole bunch more data than you have, and they you know they're sort of looking at it. And, and there's very much a paradigm of what you do. You know, you get you get your blood, you spatter it on the wall, you do all these measurements, and and you start to analyze it the way that people in your field who publish papers have analyzed it. And and again, I'm gonna I'm gonna sound critical of the rest of the world other than brilliant Bob or whatever. That's not what I'm trying to do. It's more, this is, this is more me being self-critical as well, because I did that for, for decades and realized maybe too late, and maybe you're already aware of this, that it's super important to think of, I guess, what's generally called the conceptual model of your study. You know, what do I think is going on here? So before you jump to uh, the, you know, I'm going to do these quadrats where I'm going to collect or quantify these weeds here on this date before treatment, after treatment, all that. It's just, it's just sort of sitting there with either a digital or a piece of paper and saying, what do I think is going on? What, what should I measure to kind of evaluate what's going on? What is, I mean, What's the effect of this one, I guess in Flavia's case, so I'm going to pick on you endlessly because I kind of know what you're doing. Um, what's the effect of this type of uh, weed management on the rest of the ecosystem? And it's kind of, what do you think it is? And if that's what's going on, 
what do I need to measure to actually pick pick that up? So um, it it's something that that really comes before uh, actually getting in the water or or you know planning the the field days that you're going to have or 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 how many bags do we need and all all that kind of stuff and it's it's kind of for me a lot of my the first certainly half of my career as a scientist was I'm measuring this because this is what people who do studies like I'm doing measure and I didn't think really hard enough about what I thought was going on based on my read of the literature or my notion of what's happening here and that's what that's what building a conceptual model is and um one great way and I just started Sorry, I had to put up the scary flowchart model here um, just to kind of bring my point home. But but one way I've, I started to emphasize this, that another new course I taught in the fall was called uh, Foundations of Stan Sustainability. And, you know, dealing with different sustainability topics and realizing that to really understand something, uh, you got to be able to model it. You know, and this happens to be a model of the flow of mercury in wetlands, you know, through biological and, and uh, non-biological uh, stocks and, and, and you know, translation to, to more toxic methyl mercury and all that kind of stuff. And notice that there's no numbers here. It's just saying, you know, the, the movement through the food web or the movement from inorganic particles to, to uh, biota or whatever. And... Building a model like that, um, I I found even if it's just a drawing, I found incredibly useful in the studies that I'm doing. Before and you know we'll get to a point where we try to you're going to try to guess at actual amounts of effects of this thing on that, but this is before that. This is just saying I think. Um, this is going to be the effect of temperature or or the uh, wetness of the of the uh, wetland, the saturation of the wetland, how that's going to affect methylation of mercury, whatever. It's just getting that concept down on paper and then saying, okay, if this is kind of what's going on, you know it's going to be a very rough estimate of what's going on. You know, you're not the genius right now. You know, Vivian didn't even know what phosphorus was when he started, right, Vivian? <laughs> well, not quite that. <laughs> but, and you, and you might think, well, I can't do that because I, I, I don't know. But if you don't know, you, you got to know enough to get that concept down before you run, run out and start spending a lot of time and money and all your assistance and everything collecting a bunch of stuff. Because... And again, I'm not I'm not saying this to criticize other people. This is what I did. I said, well, I gotta I gotta measure all these things. Okay, we're gonna go, we're gonna spend the month up in uh, the Yukon or whatever. And I'll I'll kind of figure it out when I've got all the data. That's when I'll I'll go to somebody like me and, and say, Well, what do I do with this data? I want to figure out what's going on. And all I'm saying is spend a bit of time, which which many of you probably have, but but I'm going to force you to do that with every every person in the course is going to have their own data that they work on in the lab assignments, right? It's not like, okay, here's this data set, do this regression or whatever. You're going to, the first thing you do in the first lab is assemble some data so that everybody, it's great for cheating, right? Because <laughs> everybody's got um, their own, uh, that's not why I do it, but Everybody's working on their own data. Well, I mean, it's it's great because you know what? I didn't understand stats really. I did really well in my second undergrad stats course, just because I kind of liked the puzzle of it. I had no understanding of it until I was a master's student, um, first year master's, I think. And I actually used some data to figure out, and at that time it was multivariate stats, figuring it out. Then I understood it because, you know, it only made, and that's why the emphasis or, or what I do a lot in this course is you work on your own data and it might be just kind of play data for the purpose of the course, but 
that's when you really understand something. You don't understand it by reading papers that do the analyses. You'll be able to read papers and kind of understand what they did. That's part of our goal, but anyway. Okay, so this kind of summarizes what I've just been saying. You don't just design, do, and analyze the experiment or your observations. You got a clear this clear conceptual model in your mind. It's going to be different shades of wrong, guaranteed. That's great. You know, finding out how you're wrong that describes my whole career. Okay, um, it'll give you a better idea what data, what you should collect, and what your results really mean. And and one game, not a game, but one thing I always uh, or often get um, grad students to do, you know, if they're if they're defending a proposal is, okay, draw a figure from your thesis where this it's going to be a picture of the result you think will really show what you think might be going on. Like pretend results. And that's a that's a bigger challenge than you think because everybody always thinks, well, I'm gonna <laughs> I'm not I'm not mocking you into this. I just I do community theater. Um, so, you know, I got all the data. I'm going to see what, I'm going to let the data tell me what's going on, you know, that, but I think it's a real challenge to yourself to say, okay, I got these, I got 75 blood spatters. I've collected, you know, how much they look like a star or whatever you do. And here's what that bar chart or, or graph is going to look like if what I really think is going on is happening here. Here's what it's going to look like if I was wrong, you know. So if you do that, it can really help you um, figure out. Okay, here I better measure this stuff for sure. Okay, boring stuff for just a minute. Um, you've you've already had this stuff, like when you were uh, taking undergrad stats. I think you had it, didn't you, Vivian? Like different types of variables, right? And there's different names that that uh, stats people give them, but basic idea is quantitative, you know, when you're measuring something or counting something and qualitative when you're putting it in categories. So quantitative, within quantitative, there's two types of variables. And I notice I, I don't tend to use fancy terms, but you'll find other terms for them. Um, if you look for them, I just want to make sure you understand conceptually the differences with different kinds of data because that affects kind of what you can do with the data. So with quantitative data, there's there's some variables where zero matters. And what I mean by that is like, um, if, if I'm studying the, the litter size of house mice, and I always make up my examples on the fly. I don't know if someday I'll actually plan them. So litter size of house mice, so some of the house mice, <laughs> I'm going to start tripping over the words, I can tell. Some of the house mice will have a litter size of zero. Some will have 12 young. Some will have three. So zero is, is real data. You know, it, it's an objective reality. Uh, same is true of um, body size. You know, like zero kilograms is... <laughs> So I just went into some weird philosophical area. Zero kilograms is a valid body. So no, it's not. There's no body there. But I think you know what I mean. The weight of something or the mass of something. Um, arbitrary zero, and you see a great example of it in that thermometer on the right there. That's just, you know, there's no objective reality unless I think, is it Lord Kelvin? Who zero Kelvin is like no heat. Sorry, I'm, not, I'm obviously not a forensic physicist. <laughs> There's no heat present or something, but zero Celsius is is not an objective reality. It just happens to be the the uh, freezing point of water. Um, so yeah, there's there's a variety of things that just have an arbitrary zero point. Sometimes those two things affect um, what you can do with the data. We'll, we'll come probably come across them a couple of times. Uh, qualitative data, so that's like categories, like gender, eye color, whatever, those, those kind of things. Nominal is just the categories don't really have any order. Um, so, so yeah, think of eye color or, um, yeah, eye color. <laughs> uh, ordinal is like 
like my uh, teaching evaluations, right? So, and it's so interesting. Teaching evaluations got to be the most misanalyzed data ever because I always think of them when I think I'm thinking of these categories. Because I guess did they did they do teaching evaluations for TAs? So you don't get like scores. <laughs> Especially if you're bad. Yeah. Well, they're not like older seven and ten. Yeah. Well, they they do that. So so I've been getting course evaluations for you know many years. It's hilarious actually when you do get into the the uh, verbal comments. You know, like within the same course, same section. He's a god. He's a bum. <laughs> we love the treats. We love when he brought his puppy to class. Nothing about learning. In life. Anyway, um, but the the quantitative part is, you know, what when you say like uh, the course changed my life. Strongly disagree. <laughs> yes. Sort of the strongly agree. And so that's a that's an ordinal categorical variable. And, and the easiest way to think about it is like is the difference between strongly disagree and kind of disagree exactly the same as strongly agree and kind of agree. So what you're saying, if you do stats on those numbers, is that, yeah, they're exactly the same, just like one degree of temperature. Well, obviously that's BS, right? But yeah, I could show you my, well, I won't show you, but, um, my course evaluations where they say, here's the mean score, here's the standard deviation of your scores, all that. You can't, you can't do that with a variable that you can do stuff with it. I'm not saying that, you know, my, the most common score I get is zero or whatever, but, um, but it does affect what sort of analyses you can do. And we'll, we'll see that a bit, a bit later on. Uh, the other thing, um, and notice how, you know, basically we're doing basic stats in 20 minutes here, but I stand by it. <laughs> like I stand by, you will walk out of this room with the same knowledge that you had after you finished a basic stats course. Um, so the other thing that you want to know is, you know, and this does depend on the type of variable, as you see here, is what's the typical value? And how, how can you kind of describe the amount of variation in the variable? So for quantitative variables, Everybody loves the average, right? The mean. Um, but it's often a terrible summary of the typical going on. You know, classic here, like these examples of university prof stuff, which is kind of juicy. So average salary of a university prof in science. And it's tremendously skewed, that average, because every salary has, you know, every dollar within every salary has equal weight on what that average is. So people like me overpaid these old guys, you know, I'm skewing up that average versus those harder working younger profs. And so the much better way to say, well, what does a typical prof make in science at Ontario Tech is the median. You know, half of them make more than that, half of them make less than that. Doesn't matter how much more you know, my God, Bailey's making 500000 a year. Uh, it's just that half of the profs make more than that number. So median, especially with those kind of skewed numbers, can be when we just want to know the typical. Forget about the stats we want to do or anything like that. It can be much more valuable. Um, qualitative, like the course evaluation or the eye color, a very common way to, to do typical value is just the mode, which is the most common category. Yeah, 12 people had blue eyes and only four had had uh, whatever my eye color. I think it's like green, brown or something like that. Um, so the mode, and sometimes it's you've heard the expression bimodal, there's two peaks or whatever. But that's that's the best way usually of expressing what what what's the typical value of a qualitative variable. In terms of variation, this is another you know, there's so much in here that's actually more interesting than you think, oh, my God, he's going to spend 20 minutes on standard deviation. Um, not quite, but 
so you will have seen, I guarantee you've seen, and we'll talk about figures in a second, um, you'll have seen a, a point at the mean with standard error bars, right? Everybody, you got to do that, you know? Don't have standard error bars. I don't know how much things vary. I can almost hear my supervisor yelling at me saying that. Where are the standard error bars? And it's a terrible way to, to uh, portray data. But anyway, so think of the ways that you can actually describe the variation. Like go back to what I said my emphasis was, I wanna just tell you what's going on in the data. And the easiest way to sit, say what's going on in the data is the range, okay? I collected this set of uh, my most litter size, host mouse litter sizes, and uh, the average was 5.2, um, what do they call baby mice? I guess they just call them baby mice. Pops? Really? Okay. I think. <laughs> I'm going to hold that. So 5.2 pups per nest. And the range was from 0 to 24. And that that sounds pretty That's pretty good. Gives me an idea. But the, the problem with that one is it's all based on two numbers, right? That range. You got this one totally weird mouse who had 24 kids. And you get... Maybe, or maybe there's a lot that are up in the 20. Don't know. We just know the range. So that's why the standard deviations often used as a measure. That's that's where every mouse, or at least every mouse litter, is getting the equal shot at what the variability is. Um, standard error and confidence interval, those are the ones I really have a problem with, which is kind of funny because, you know, Again, you always have to do these plots with standard error bars. The problem with standard error and, and uh, confidence intervals, and we'll talk about confidence intervals next time, um, is they're totally dependent on how much work you did, right? Think of, think of uh, if we're doing our house mouse projects. <laughs> First of all, say house mouse for, you know, several times <laughs> really quickly. But if we're doing that project, and we want to know, yeah, what's the typical litter size? Okay, we're going to measure a bunch of them. And um, how much do they vary? And we do the range, we do the standard deviation. None of those numbers I just talked about, typical, maybe measured as the average or the median, and then the range or the standard deviation, none of those are exactly dependent on the number of nests that I actually found, right? Whereas standard error, I won't bore you with the formula. We'll maybe get into that next time. But remember, it's, divide, it's the standard deviation divided by the square root of n. It's kind of, it gets smaller when you do more work. But doing more work doesn't make the house mouse litters less variable, right? It just, you have a more precise idea what they are, and that's reflected in the confidence interval as well. So if I'm wanting to describe house mouse litters, I'm going to rely on average or median, and I'm going to rely on range, and probably range and standard deviation. Okay, so qualitative um, data, that's the one, the category, categorical. Um, and people don't often worry about the variability of qualitative data. You know, think of, I don't know, do you classify the blood spatters into different categories? Like this one was really gross. This one was sort of gross. This one was flat. This one was kind of squishy. Um, but if you if you collect a bunch of them, you might say, yeah, this the most common was the squishy. You know, like over half of them were squishy. The, all the other categories were less than 50%. So that's that's interesting. That's sort of the typical value. But then you might want to know, well, how much do they vary? You know, how many categories did I see? And so in ecology, we, we have this, these diversity measures. So one thing you can use, well, how many categories were there? What was the richness? And then diversity is just kind of how evenly spread were the observations among those different categories. So if you get into that for your research, we can talk about it more. But that's just, that's a good measure of variation. 
okay, here's here's the the most important and controversial one. <laughs> um, what do you plot? Uh, so quantitative data, as I was saying, um, most often now, if you look at papers, and I'm sure this will happen, each of you will will bring a paper um, to you know to do your final presentation from your from your research area. There'll be a plot with standard error marks, and um, so as I say, pretty much ubiquitous is this plot uh, with a bar with a mean and standard error bars for each group or variable. Um, better is so standard <laughs> the the okay and then the better that i have here is um that sometimes with standard error bars you you've got a number which is standard error for all the groups so the the sticks are the same size based on your ANOVA or whatever you've done but better than that, I want to know about the variability within each group. You know, is this group more variable than the other? Um, so that's what I have labeled there as the better. The best is really simple, what I call the box plot. And amazingly, and, and you'll do box plots in the first lab. They're, and many of you have probably done them before. But um, amazingly, so I happen to have a subscription to the Globe and Mail. And this morning, <laughs> there was... There was, a, and you can't really see this. I'll maybe try to blow it up. There. In the Globe and Mail, in the business section, there was, not only were there box plots used, this, this is, uh, and it's, it's actually interesting because it's, I don't agree with the interpretation of the study, but um, so on the, I'll move the, uh, the Zoom thing out of the way. So you've got, these are um, women and it's life is life expectancy. How long the, or life duration, I guess, um, not life expectancy because it's based on, on women who have died. Uh, born, I think from 1890 to 1920. And it's trying to show, it's comparing the um, lifespan of women in different careers. So on the left, you've got Olympic athletes. Uh, on the right, you've got actresses. And in the, in the middle, just as a comparative point, you've got the average Canadian, I guess, born in that time period. So let's leave aside the interpretation of it, which I think is somewhat sketchy. But here you have the, you know, Canada's national newspaper this morning, and look at how they're explaining a box plot here. So the median lifespan, this is just for Olympic athletes here, is that is that horizontal line. The average is marked with the X. And then the, the box here, the height of the box is from the 25th percentile. So a quarter of the women had lifespans lower than that to the 75th percentile at the top of the box. So that the height of that box is a measure of the variability of that group and lifespan. And then the the sticks go on these so-called whiskers. That's the range of the data, except for the odd person that's so-called outlier. And I think outliers defined usually as being more than one and a half um, beyond the the uh, edge of the twenty fifth and seventy fifth percentiles. But the bottom line that you know I just love. The box plot. Look at all the information that is in that box plot. So you've got the the Olympic athletes. Their uh, lifespan, median lifespan, was about ninety two years old. Um, there, it's skewed. Notice how there's fewer women, smaller proportion of women above ninety two years than below ninety two years. Same thing with the variability, the range there, and that one outlier of the Olympic athlete who died in her early 40s. So, you know, look at the information you're getting relative to if they just put the, you know, they had that X where, which is the average and they had standard error bars on it. And that, that's what I'm talking about. Like you wanna put as much interpretable information in your plot as possible. 
Okay. So that's quantitative data. So in general, and I just, I just published a paper, which was the only uh, representation of at least univariate quantitative data was box box, different groups. And controversially, and we'll get into this in a couple of weeks, no, no hypothesis test, but are those groups different? Uh, let's do a, a posteriori students, Newman, K, LSD. I want to know that these groups are really different, or this one's got an asterisk, this one doesn't, it's all baloney. But okay, so what about qualitative data? So this is, as I was saying earlier, um, this is the only pie chart in all of stats presentation that I've ever liked. So uh, the the best way, and it's, you know, you'll see, and probably you folks use, have used already um, graphics software that, you know, maybe you can do a three-dimensional pie. Maybe you can do, you know, all, all that stuff. It, it really gets back to what is the best way to show what's going on? Not the most beautiful pie with the piece coming out with the group that you're really interested in and all that. What is the best way to show the relative frequency in each of those categories? And, um, and we'll see some examples of this uh, later on with, when we're working with the R scripts, but uh, the, a grouped, what's called a grouped histogram or bar chart, um, bar chart is actually the appropriate term here for, for qualitative data. Um, and to avoid three-dimensional stuff and pies tend to just obscure what's actually going on. So they might uh, superficially look better but um, again, they, they uh, obscure the point that you're trying to make. And okay, that's all I want to say about that. All right, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna spend a couple of minutes talking about what we actually do in the course, but I'll stop there for, for folks who wanna say something about what I've talked about. Have I changed your life yet? Or you know, we're just kind of building up momentum. We're getting there. <laughs> Vivian, are you good? Is this all jive with the stat you've had already? To be honest with you, I don't remember anything from the statistics course I learned, I don't know, like a year and a half ago. So it was back in second year. So I have no clue. I think I'm just sort of that's good. No, relearning it's, everything. It's the best way to be, honestly. And, and yeah, I, I say that to grad students as well because um People sometimes, especially, I guess, because I've been teaching the course for long now, oh, my God, I, I, I better go back. And I think I even advise um, a friend of mine at Guelph, Andrew McAdam, has a pretty good kind of refresher of intro stats. So I've got links to that because people get tense about it. But the very best way to be is like a tabula rasa, you know, like, like just... But the one thing I would stress is if I say something that you think that that's just wrong, you know, like, like, don't be afraid to, you know, even though I look like this grizzled old stuck in my ways ranter or whatever, don't be afraid to say, but, but wait a second, you can't say that you accepted the null hypothesis, right? Or some, some, remember there's this thing in intro stats, you can reject a null. But you can just, well, what was the wording? Um, you can fail to reject the null. But you can't say you accept the null because you don't know if the null is true. You can just say you failed to reject it. Like, give me a break. You don't know if the null is false when you reject it. And uh, that that gets to, in a future, one of my favorite slides that I've made ever that you'll see. But yeah, don't don't be afraid to say, well, I thought it was this. Like, don't. Don't worry about in this room about um, you know saying something that I don't want to reveal that I'm a fool or something like that. We're all fools. 